You got it. All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with uh, John Peretti. Yeah, I'm real excited to do this interview. And, uh, you know, before we start, I have a sponsor who makes uh, fight banners of gym banners called Live to Fight Design. You can find them on Instagram at Live to Fight Design. And if you use my name, Todd Atkins, you can get $20 off of one of those banners. And uh, for people that are in the old school, we all know about John Peretti, you know, and his, you know, he's kind of a legend in the old school. And, uh, but for newer people who don't know who you are, I'm going to just kind of let you introduce yourself a little bit. Um, well, I'm a past pugilist. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm a lifelong martial artist. Um, and uh, I come from a generation of, uh, of uh, pugilists. Um, I'm a third generation. Uh, my great grand uncle won the Golden Gloves in New York City um, in the lightweight division, um, and, and it's you know it's in my blood. Um, you know, I I started uh, training at sixteen. I was a terrible athlete. Like my junior high school track coach told me, I was the worst athlete that he had ever coached. Of course, he was a, uh, a genius um, science teacher uh, who said that um, the United States would be switching to the metric system by 74. Um, so he, uh, he uh, had his opinions. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so I've been dedicated. Um, uh, I studied uh, Wing Chun with uh, Stephen Gork uh, and uh, with um, Stephen Ang in New York. Uh, I am a New Yorker. Um, I am living in Texas um, and um, I am a sheriff's deputy at Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office. Um, I started this uh, sport with Donald Zuckerman uh, and the idea came from Richard Crudo um, to create extreme fighting. Um, uh, I decided uh, with Donald um, that uh, it would be the um, rules, rounds, weight classes, gloves uh, with Dr. Joseph Estwanek. Um, the, the idea for me was to, uh, see who was the best fighter in the world. I did tryouts everywhere in the world. Um, I, I tried out everybody personally. Um, the, uh, we trained a lot in New York city in my school, uh, 109 West 26th street on the fourth floor. Um, I, uh. You know, I was involved from the from the get go. Uh, I met Donald on the Upper East Side in New York uh, and was immediately hired as a referee. Uh, and then on and on and on, Donald and I are still close, close friends. Mm, we went on to do the contenders together, um, which was the first grappling show. Um, it was an incredible uh, uh, political climate in the time. I, I, I was on all the uh, talk shows, uh, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and Bill Donahue, and uh, Geraldo, and um, uh, Jerry Springer. And I mean, I toured the whole deal, um, trying to promote mixed martial arts, which I coined. Um, and that's pretty easy to figure out because there's press release for extreme fighting that that first put it out. Um, I had been using that term for eight years prior. Um, so yeah, so it was a four show deal. Um, and then the ultimate politically put, uh, put us out of business. And a week later, I was hired by them um, to be their matchmaker, color commentator um, for uh, some bouts. Um, um, I believe it was uh, Isaac 
and uh, and Bob Meyerowitz, a uh, wonderful guy. Um, that's I mean, uh, my background is giant diversification. You know, I'm a I'm a writer. Um, I was a painter. I taught college at School of Visual Arts in New York City for ten years. Um, um, I have a very diversified background. Let me ask you this now, for people that don't know, what year was it when extreme fighting first started? It's like 26 years ago. Um, got to do the math. I'm not good at math. Was it 94? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It was, it was 26 years ago. Because Donald just wrote me and uh, I think he said it was 26 years ago. Yeah, now you said it was the idea of who did you mention it was? Because you said you Richard were... Richard Richard Crudo was uh, um, came to Donald and said that they wanted to do this this kind of fight show. Now at the at the time before uh, we had this meeting uh, in in L.A. It was pretty funny. Um, the uh, there were all kinds of people there. Uh, you know, martial arts people. You know, who couldn't tie their shoes. Um, and I was training with Jean LaBelle. I'm, I'm uh, one of the four original black belts from Jean LaBelle. Um, with, uh, the first was this guy named Silverado. I can't remember his last name. I'm, I apologize to him for that. Um, and the next was John Donahue, who was my referee. And then was John Lewis and then myself. Those are the original black belts from Jean LaBelle. Um, and uh, so uh, we had this meeting and they, we want, they were like, I had opinions on this from from early early on, um, and you know at a time there was a time where it was going to be a, a giant plexiglass container, and two people would be like lowered down into it, but they couldn't figure out how to shoot it because it was going to have blood splattered on it and so on and so forth. So anyway, so it evolved. I designed the uh, the ring. Uh, the ring was ensolite foam, which could be washed very quickly, and there wouldn't be any. Um, it's what wrestlers use, um, and there wouldn't be any uh, any kind of like blood residue on it. I was very concerned about health. Uh, you know that a lot of guys um, in Japan uh, ended up getting hepatitis B um, from from these kinds of fights, and Canvas held that kind of uh, that kind of um, uh, residue from blood. Uh, and, and we were the first to uh, to do CAT scans and we were the first to do blood tests for AIDS um, and, and so on and so forth. But anyway, so, yeah, it became, you know, uh, Donald and I hit it off really well. And um, uh, and Rich Crudo was not involved in it at all. But who is Rich Crudo? Just just out of so Rich Crudo is that you should you should probably look him up as we speak. But he was uh, he was. He's a um, he was a DP, a uh, really famous uh, director of photography and film, um, and he was also uh, nothing to do with martial arts. And um, and he was also uh, I think he was the head of SAG for a while, uh, for a long time. Um, but but he has a giant resume. That's interesting. He's the one who wanted to do a fight show. Well, you know, there's all kinds of fans. I mean, it's not like it's not a homogenous situation like today, you know, where everybody has a little sticker on the back of their truck that says tap out, you know, and and everybody is a jujitsu, you know, uh, place in every shopping mall. It was like Taekwondo of the 70s, you know, you know, jujitsu in every shopping mall, you know, um, that I mean, we did that and we created that, you know, Hori and Gracie and his and his silly 16 first shows, you know, created that. I want to get back to the design of the ring because this is something I want to kind of go deeper into because this is kind sure. of those things that we were talking about offline. You so the, designed the, it as a round ring. Absolutely, because the round ring had no corners, right? So there's no place to get stuck in. I use lobster wire, uh, coated lobster wire, because um, you, um, you uh, could shoot it uh, visually through the lobster wire much easier than chain link and chain link moved and looked cheap. Um, so the lobster wire went really, really well. I also sprung it. So um, 
uh, underneath the ring was these giant springs in the middle so that so that when you landed on it, you would reduce the anvil factor. Um, the anvil factor was something I coined early, early on, where you know you could uh, you could throw an, uh, a horseshoe up in the air and hit it with a hammer and it go flying across the room, right? But um, I can hardly see you. I'm trying to get rid of this thing that's in front of me here. Got it. Okay, now I got you. Um, and uh, so, but if I lay your head on the ground, right? and hit it down, it would be malleable. Basically, I had an anvil, I have the horseshoe, and I have my hammer. Now, all of a sudden, I can make you into something else, right? I can make you that a malleable situation increase the force. So when you start hitting people and their head is not is down on a piece of, you know, three pieces of plywood or something like in the ultimate, you know, you got a lot of damage inside the skull. Remember that like I was creating um, a, a contact sport, unlike football, which is a collision sport, right? And you go flying, right? But this is a contact sport and the anvil factor was uh, concerned me a lot. So I had the ring sprung. Also, I was dealing with really great wrestlers and, um, you know, I wanted that ring sprung and I wanted them to be able to use their shoes. And I wanted that surface to be uh, to be Ensolite foam. In my school in New York City, we had Ensolite foam, too. Now, maybe talk about the corners, because I know that's something I had heard you talk about. That it's really important to me today. Yeah, it's really important to me at the time was to not have things break up the the. Uh, the uh, the thing that was going on. In fact, there was this real, there's great joke after, I think it was the first show um, that was called the John Lewis rule, um, where you couldn't like overhook the fence and put your fingers in it to hold yourself up. You know, so that was the John Lewis rule. John's a close personal friend of mine uh, still, and uh, was with me from the, the very get go. Um, so no corners. It was a it was a faster surface. Okay, obviously there was less blood on the surface because it cleaned up instantly. Um, and and I thought that the lobster wire was was much more structural, uh, so it had much more integrity when you got put up against it. Uh, all these things were very very important to me. But talk about the corners as far as a sticking point. You know these things that you had mentioned before. Well, you know, you saw you saw in the ultimate people getting pinned into the corner. You know that that you know that became a problem, and you know, and you know that accompanied by say people didn't know when to stop the fight. Um, you know, could be a problem for for the uh, for the people, and I didn't want to stand people up because it, it just you know it just. If you were stuck in a corner, you got you got you got crushed in there, and then you know you, it had to be stood up and change position, or you know you could do that fake hand craze thing where they would freeze, and then they came in, and then they slid you out into the middle to start again. Um, and you know people watch that stuff and they believe it, you know, but that was a work. Now why did why also? Did, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I stepped on you. No, I mean, I was wondering, I mean, I know the UC can't change the shape. They have the octagon. But why do you think they never changed the fencing like you talked about with the lobster wire? That's something they could have done, perhaps. They've done a lot of things, but, you know, Bob didn't want to do a lot of things. You know, I mean, I, ha I had to, like, twist his little ears off to, to just to get weight classes. You know, I mean, it's just... I don't know. He just was not interested in the things that were created before the ultimate. You know, if you think about my rules, they were fully adopted. You know, why if you think th about, I'm sorry. Why do you think they haven't made small, you know, changes since then, even now? I have no idea. How would I know that? I don't know how they think. Yeah. It's just interesting that they haven't, because some of these things they maybe could implement that no one would really probably have a problem with you know if 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 your aunt had balls she'd be your uncle that's true 
That's now let's talk about the weight classes because that's another thing you brought in from right from the start. Five weight classes. Um, we wanted to know who was the best in the world in weight classes um, because, you know, big guys accept mediocrity easily. I mean, I, I've said that on the air. Um, so <laughs> the real reason is I was trying to create a sport that, you know, that that I could win. Right. Uh, it was 20, 20 years past my prime. But in my mind, you know, whenever like karate tournaments, you know, you'd win the lightweight division. Right. And then you got this gift and then you got to fight for the grand championship against the heavyweight guy. And I, I had 16 concussions. Uh, I mean, I never won against the heavyweight guy. They always knocked me out. So I, I didn't want to see that shit. You know, the, the, it just it made no fucking sense to me from the from the get go. And uh, and you know, there's a lot of things that you know that I learned the hard way. You know, there, if you look at the people who promote, you know, these sports, um, very few originally were fighters. You know, so uh, I was. So, you know, you, you, you think out of the box as a fighter and I wanted to do it right. And also like the gloves, this is another thing you did that nobody really he, mentions with you. You got the, you got, you got, you got to watch fights where, where guys, I, I wasn't protecting heads at this point, I was protecting hands because you got to watch these fights that lasted four seconds because the, they threw a big right hand on a skull and, and broke the hand. So, and then people started wearing like one glo boxing glove or some stupid shit. You got to understand that, you know, uh, the ultimate was not the sport. You know, the ultimate was the, uh, no, the, I mean, it's hard for people to understand that that what they were looking at wasn't actually what was really going on. Um, so this this uh, this thing that they presented and the thing that I presented were diametrically opposite. And my intentions and their intentions were completely different until I was hired to do that job over there. So I, I can't answer you, Todd. I would like to answer you and say, well, they could have done this and they could have done that. And they could have done this, but they didn't. And they were, you know, really died in the wool. You know, um, Bob loved the heavyweights, you know, so he had all these guys who couldn't tie their shoes um, as heavyweights, you know. And then when real matches came and they and he said, well, you, you, you got to put Dan Severn in. He's he's our champion. And uh, we couldn't tie his shoes, so put him in against a top ten guy like Pedro Izzo, and made him look like he was in slow motion. But I mean, when it came to the gloves, what did you think? The glove that you brought in, like, did you did you design one, or did you, did you just bring one in? We designed we designed from, for four of them for the size of hands. Now I have actually. For a, a small guy, I have big hands. Um, like Boss Rutten had hands this long. Um, it it just it's so we sized them and then we had them sewn and then we had them weighed because they had to be com comparable in weight. It was it was, it was actually you know uh, in retrospect you know uh, Doctor Swanick you know just an incredibly great guy. Um, but I'll never forgive him for not copywriting. The glove, uh, <laughs> and we joke about that, but you know, we, that glove is was it changed the sport, um, and uh, and and uh, Bob didn't actually want to use it. Yeah, that is crazy. I mean, because you you're the one who brought those gloves in, and you know, you probably don't see anything I, for it. I can't. I can't. I can't. You know, I can't rationalize a lot of the things that uh, that that occurred you know I, I just I found it some of this stuff really goofy 
let's talk a little bit about Zuckerman because he was involved in the show with you. Kind of tell me what he did. Oh, everything. I, I mean, he was an octopus. Um, it, it, Donald, first, first of all, is a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and he is the uh, film commissioner uh, for, um, for Colorado, uh, which he, he changed a lot of stuff for Colorado there. And I think it's been like, he's been there for 20 years already. Uh, it, as a, I, I was a, a stunt coordinator and a stuntman, um, and uh, Donald and I worked on a lot of films together, um, and uh, we were close, close friends. Um, we had Thanksgivings together. I spoke to him on Thanksgiving. Um, but Zuckerman was amazing. You know, Zuckerman, when people thought they had us, like at Stream Fighting 2, you know, at Kanawagi, uh, where they, like, confiscated all my fighters and, you know, and, and did changed everything and just made everything illegal, instantly illegal. And, you know, Marowitz is involved in all that, you know, that, that stuff. Um, and uh, made it so difficult, you know, Donald would bring a, uh, would bring a, um, a dish in from like Toronto instead and, and come in and, and hook it up. And when they took all our, and threatened all our, uh, our, our guys, our cameramen, and we didn't have, we didn't have audio and we didn't know what the fuck was going on. And, you know, everyone was getting arrested and just Donald was in charge of all that. Donald was the, the brilliance behind, uh, extreme fighting. Um, what he did not do is he did not contradict me um and, and in our search for talent and donald did all the uh um negotiating and all the money um and uh and things of that nature and i could do what i do best and focus on the um you know designing the uh, uh posters and uh being the uh, liaison for the fighters and um and really focus on the creative part of extreme fighting uh and the contenders uh, he was my partner in the contenders, um, and, uh, and not have to, uh, and not have to do the things that he did so well, uh, you know, as a, an accomplished lawyer and an, and, and, and an ADA, you know, in New York prior. I want to get your opinion on something. Cause I know like the marketing was a little bit different than like, say you, John Peretti, the serious martial artist, you had, you know, the best matches and the best talent compared to the UFC, but your mark the marketing was a little bit different like you said you went on sally jesse Raphael and all these different talk shows kind of more of a i guess fitting because it was called extreme fighting your marketing was more of to the extreme i would say compared to the ufc do you agree no no you do know. i mean yeah the 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 axiom uh whatever it takes to win you know, is, is one thing, but uh, the show was 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 a sport, right? Right. You know, and and the UFC was a spectacle. But what I mean was, like Wormy was saying, James Wormy, who I he was saying, okay, the promotional aspect of, you know, the shows you were going on these talk shows, you know, the Jerry Springer ish type aspect of it. He said he thought that may have affected extreme fighting. Do you agree with that or no? No, I don't. And I'll tell you why. Because um, if you looked at um, uh, his the the show um, Jerry Springer at the time, you saw that it was a talk show, right? And when I came on um, on that talk show. Um, and, uh, we did our little thing with, with, uh, health Gracie and John Lewis. And, um, we, uh, we were telling the truth about what was going on. And then after the show, Jerry Springer said to me, you know, this is really the future. What you're doing, it really is the future. And after that show, he changed his show to become the violent pseudo show that it became. Because I don't know, you haven't seen my interview with James, but he was saying, 
You, you know, interviewed James Wormy? I did. And it's the first one he's ever done, I guess. But what he was saying was when they had to move down to Dothan, Extrema came in and they were going to do a show at the Armory or whatever in Brooklyn. And he was saying... No, no stop, stop, stop. Okay. Time out. No, all right. Um, we had we had we had the garden madison square garden but the powers that be started saying that we were the violent show and that that the ultimate was like the you know the really nice show but ours was this really violent show now where they get that information from you think so we got kicked out of the garden then we got kicked out of that, of the armor. And then we got kicked out. And then we had to go to this ridiculous uh, uh, set uh, to do the show. But then the, the UC also had to leave, right? I don't remember what they did. They went to I Dothan, was Alabama, about, right? I don't remember, honestly. Yeah. But, but you know, you, James and I oh, always saw eye to eye. Um, and... But um, you, you have to understand that there's, you know, the kind of pressure that extreme fighting was under, you know, it was unbelievable. You know, that's where that the whole thing uh, with uh, with uh, McCain, you know, saying that it was uh, human cockfighting, you know, I mean, that was all directed at me, don't forget. Let's talk about some of the fighters, some of the important fighters that you had, you know, like John Lewis and how crazy. Well, wait, yeah, just hang on a second, though. Okay. You got here's a, this is really important to understand. Mm -hmm. Unlike the ultimate, I designed a pyramidal system, right? So, so and so fights so and so, right? And if it's a good fight, right, and no one wins, we rematch it, right? But if you, but if this A fighter wins, B fighter. Later on, if it's a great fight, maybe I'll pull B fighters in against C fighters and so on and so forth. But the pyramidal system is so that we can find out who the best fighter is in a particular weight class, correct? You, you understand that, right? So it's a very formal system, right? When people call up and say, well, you know, uh, I was promised to fight so-and-so and this and that. And that. I said, who are you? Uh, well, I did that. And, and who have you fought? Uh, well, I bought, you know, Joey at the bar last week and, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it didn't work like that with me. And we did tryouts all the time and uh, open tryouts. And so I always was looking for talent. Um, so there were great, great fighters that I brought to the ultimate. You know, not only did I come to the ultimate, I came with a bag of tricks. Right. And also rules and also rounds and also so on and so forth but also with the talent under my arms so go ahead right so i'd say there's some fighters that guys who are back around back then fans guys that would come to mind right off the bat that you had guys like half and john lewis zenovia some of these other guys maybe talk about some of those guys who would you like me to talk about uh Oh, maybe Lewis first, since you were with him kind of from the get-go, like you'd said. So John was an incredibly acrobatic guy um, who uh, who I trained with, and and uh, we trained together for a couple of years. Um, and then we went to LaBelle's together, and then John went to, you know, Hickson's uh, together. And did you know that Hickson decided last year that he invented the mixed martial arts club? It doesn't, did you hear this shit? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, he, he, I mean, here's a guy who couldn't break an egg, right? Never hit anybody. His whole methodology is that you don't hit people, right? And, and all of a sudden he decides that, you know, he invented something that he didn't even know how to use. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's baffling. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, I rode off on my horse called Tangent. Um, so John, John and I were were, were really tight, um, and uh, uh, we used to go to Lavelle's every weekend, and uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we trained together. We knew each other really well, um, and. Uh, 
and he rose in the ranks, uh, you know, in jujitsu and became one of the, I don't know, the dirty dozen original non-Brazilians and all that stuff. Um, and uh, and um, he's a really good dancer too, by the way. Really good. Um, in fact, he was at he was at my wedding um, in in L.A. Uh, my second wife. <clears throat> uh, who else? I mean, Zinoviev is uh, one of the most incredible guys I ever trained. Um, just outstanding. The things I did with him, I, I, mean, I made him swim underwater. You know, with me, uh, I was a free diver um, and breath hold stuff after training all day. I'd have three people fighting him at the same time. And, you know, um, we had incredible school, uh, two incredible schools. Um, and Zenobia was uh, just <clears throat> unbelievable. You know, a veteran of uh, the USSR versus, uh, uh, versus uh, Afghanistan. And uh, just an incredible, an incredible human being. Injured a lot. Um, he was injured when he fought Frank. He was injured. He couldn't go into the contenders. He, uh, had, he had a, a lower back problem. He had a neck problem. Um, but, uh, but heroic, amazing, heroic guy. He was supposed to fight. He was supposed to fight. Um, we were, Donald was working on a deal with, uh, with Horian for him to fight, uh, uh, what's his name, um, in, in extreme fighting, um, uh, Hoist. Wow. That would have been a great fight. Hoist would have lost. There's no doubt about that. Right, right. That's why, that's why I got the great, great Mario Ferry in there to fight. And uh, wow, what a great fighter Mario Ferry was, man. Holy shit. I mean, he, he, he could have beat Hoist, you know, like a game. Uh, oh, but come on, uh, you know, think about the fighters that 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 we had are just incredible, incredible. You know, I brought I brought you know Olympic wrestlers to to this sport. You know, Kenny Monday and Kevin Jackson. Uh, just, just think about it. Uh, I just think about any weight class you want, um, you know, Pat Militich, uh, just, uh, it goes on and on and on. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. The, uh, the talent that, that I was so lucky to find. Let me ask you about how, so do you think he, I kind of felt like he, he still kind of got overshadowed by like Hoyce. Do you think he, do you agree with me maybe or no? Uh, what's the question? How do you think he ever really kind of emerged from under a hoist, you know, because they were kind of fighting at the same time? Uh, health, I could have matched later on in life against top 10, top 20 guys, and you would have lost. He had a very limited game, um, but I had nobody I could match him against you know, at the time, because we didn't have that kind of talent pool available. Uh, but um, health had a very limited game. Um, so each, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would say they're on the same level, you know, with Hoist, but, you know, who did Hoist fight? But they were very different guys. You had Hoist is kind of like the passive style, that, and Hauk, who was very aggressive. Yeah, I think that, that health was just a much more aggressive person. Um, uh, it was very difficult to speak for me to speak to him. Um, I mean, he was no Mario Sperry, my God. Uh, just, you know, um, Hickson said that all of my black belts uh, that I had in, in extreme fighting and uh, in uh, the contenders were all purple belts. So, you know, like these guys came and agree, you know, on, on themselves, you know, I mean, when I started extreme fighting, I was, I was training at the Machados. When they found out I was gonna make a sport that you could get knocked out trying to get a go behind choke or a straight arm bar, they kicked me out of their school. 
Think about that. Think about what I'm saying. It's very important to understand that there was this whole mystique and, uh, and the reality was that you could get knocked the fuck out trying to get a go behind choke or a straight arm bar on somebody. You could be there in your little pajamas and, uh, you know, and, and really get hurt. Right. And that proved itself. You know, you, all you needed to understand was that you needed to defend the tackle. And now all of a sudden kickboxers, great kickboxers could, could beat the shit out of you. You know, you know it, don't forget, this is a sport I was creating. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, you know, a, a commercial for a style. Like the ultimate at the time. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was just an infomercial. How did you, for people that weren't around back then, you know, with the mentality that you're talking about with the Machados, that was kind of prevalent. How did you feel when they <laughs> kicked you out of your school for that? They made up some story about me that that I called in uh, to them and, and insulted John Machado on the phone. And, and I said, you, you, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know uh, 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 an English speaking voice from another English speaking voice. I didn't call anybody in and I would have talked to you right to your face, you know, so what, what are you talking about? Um, but again, yeah, there's a lack of mentality there. And, uh, you know, um, um, I tried to get guys to fight so much. I mean, I had Hegan Machado matched against all kinds of people that had a really easy chance of, uh, of beating and he wouldn't take a fight. You know, I even put him, was going to put him against Tom Erickson in the contenders and he wouldn't take a fight. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, I tried to get Hickson to fight, you know, because who has Hickson fought? Nobody. Right. Oh yeah, that I fought this guy on the beach and he was big and strong and yeah. I'm right there with you on Hicks and I took a lot of flack for saying these kinds Ooh. of things online back in the day. See the point the point really is that that who'd you fight? You know, who'd you fight? You know, oh did you fight? Who'd you fight? I mean, I'd like to know who you fought, you know. Oh well, you know, uh so and so, you know, he was a great fighter. He's having a hoodie fight. I'm fine, nobody. So, okay, so how are we going to talk about him? How are we going to make this pyramid system, you know, make sense if you didn't fight anybody? Right? See, you fight, you fight, you get guys like, you know, you fight, oh, oh, Boss Rutten. Well, I put him up against Randleman, you know, and, uh, you know, it's an incredible fight, you know. Um, People didn't talk to me for years after that fight. Um, you got to know who these people are fighting. You know, you got to know, you know, what's what, even, you know, to have, you know, minor fighters fight other minor fighters. You're still making a pyramid. You're still trying to find out who's the top, top dog. Right. So you, they need to fight diversified people, you know, all of a sudden you get like world-class, you know, wrestler in there and he could take you down. But so, so what, you know, Kevin Jackson took, uh, took uh, Frank Shamrock down and it was like a, a seven second fight to an arm bar. It's like, listen, you're an incredibly skilled man, right? And you have fourth gear forward because you're a wrestler and you are a great wrestler, but you're going up against Frank Shamrock, right? And the thing you don't want to do is tackle him, right? So what does he do? He comes out and fucking tackles him. You know, if you if if I say, hey, Frank, I got a fight for you. He goes, fuck, I know this is going to be a real fight because if he put me up against him, it's a real fight. It's a real, it's a real match. And, you know, and Frank comes out cream of the crop. I mean, you just, it just, you don't get any better than that. Yeah. You could, 
you have some people have much better legs and some people could do this better and some, but as a homogenous, like all around guy, you just don't get better than that. That's just, that's just, he's fucking, he's just great. He's just great. Yeah, there's better, better guys on the ground, you know, as, as, uh, you know, um, but were they as strong as him? Fuck no. Could they climb trees like him? No. Did they cross train like him? No. So, I mean, the guy was fucking amazing, you know. Um, he, he just was amazing. Yeah, I told James Wormy I felt like Frank was the first best fighter we had ever seen. The first one. Like the first best fighter of all time we had ever seen. Really? The first one. You know, there's been others since then. No, no, no. I think that's I think that's I think that's myopic actually on your part, Todd. Uh, because um uh, there's just I mean there's just so many just so many um wonderful, wonderful fighters that that, that came out before Frank even. Um uh, not that I'm taking anything away from Frank, you know. I'm just, uh, there's just so many great guys, you know. Like I was telling him, I remember when he fought Tito, I was I was living on Oahu and like all these guys that were in the MMA circle at the time. There was only one bar where we could go watch the UFC. They were all there. All the guys who fought in Super Brawl, TJ Thompson was there, the Nui brothers, all these people were there. And I remember after the fight, they're all like, you know, they had that look on their face and, you know, some are saying, if we don't do what this guy's doing, you know, you're not going to beat him unless we, he was kind of like that. You know, if we don't, aren't willing to put in what he's willing to put in. I think, I think that's true, but that's a different statement. You know, um, well, I mean, When you look at when you look at you know incredible guys, um, let's just look at the middleweight division, right? That was the division that Boss, who Boss and I were really close friends for a long time. Um, in fact, I did the Boss written Invitational. That was my brainchild, right? Because I wasn't allowed to have my own show because Meyerowitz wouldn't let me. So I did this pro am show called the Boss written Invitational. I said, "Hey, Boss, we're going to use your name." And we're going to do this. We use the extreme fighting ring and uh, we're going to do the boss root invitation. It's like, okay, great. And then I, I said, oh, I can't be a matchmaker for it, but I'll be the referee for it. And that was fun in itself. Um, but boss knew right away that the heavyweight division was weak. So at 201 pounds, if he actually even weighed that on the day, um, he became a heavyweight. Because he knew that the middleweight division was psycho fucking dangerous, right? You had Lober, right? Who literally is psychotic. Um, uh, strong as a house. Um, you had Shamrock. You had, you had a, on a healthy night, you had Zenobia, which anybody could get hurt you know on a healthy night um you had you had you had secondaries that were just unbelievable by the way you know the militants wanted to fight uh um shamrock which i never gave him that but but you know, Milicic is a bigger guy than you think he is, though. You know, I mean, like if I was when I wrestle with Milicic, you know, I look like a little like a boy next to him. You know, so I mean, he had a big, he had a big head, and you know, he's big hands. He was a strong, big, big, strong, strong guy. Just a really, 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 really strong guy. He had a back problem too. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is that the middleweight division was thick. You know, and you also had, you know, people like jujitsu guys that were incredible um, that were in the middleweight division. And then you had the axe murderer, you know, who I coined his name as the axe murderer because of his face. But, you know, Bandelay was just, I, I found him on a beach 
in in Brazil. You know, I mean, <laughs> the the talent was so thick that you know, boss wanted no part of it. You know, but 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 hang on a second. But you know, you said before that you thought that Frank was like the the, the first big deal, right? And, and I'm not debating it, but I think you forgot about Maurice Smith. You know, Maurice Smith was like a world champion kickboxer. You know, he was world champion at you know a, a lot of things. He was extreme fighting champion. You know, then he became ultimate fighting champ. I mean, Maurice Smith was. When he was willing to stand there and throw right hands, he was the most dangerous guy in the ring. He could do things that you, you talk about that 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 horrible corner in the octagon. He was one of those guys who had hips that could actually get him out of a corner and stand up again. Mm -hmm. he, he, you don't he, you don't have to understand how difficult that is yeah. to do um, as a grappler. You know, as a stand-up fighter first, and, and a grappler after, you you have to understand. I could never do it. I could never do that, even up against a guy like, I don't know, like John Lewis. You know, I couldn't do that. Once I was pinned in that corner, my hips just didn't work like that. That guy had amazing hips and a great right hand and a just a wonderful right leg. You know, and con conversely, you know, Boss Rudin had the great left leg. I know world. I know world class right legs because I had a world class right leg, right. So and Bill Wallace had a world class left leg. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I know what I'm talking about in terms of talent. I know what talent looks like, and you can't you can't take Maurice Smith out of that limelight picture. He just too diversified and just. Oh, that's a great point. Really, You're right. That's my opinion. You're right about that. I want to ask you something. Now, I don't know how much of this stuff you watched today. I don't watch anything. I haven't watched one fight since since I left. But you probably know, like, kind of, maybe not the fighters themselves, but where the UFC's at today. Do you... Let me ask well, you this. UFC... You know, they're... Okay. are you aware that they're going up in this antitrust suit? Have you heard anything about that? No, sir. Well, they're they're going to be a, they're going up an antitrust lawsuit that's going to start, I think, in April. You know, that's okay. been been around for the last decade or so, but now uh -huh. finally, finally, the judges let it go forward. You know that there's been some, uh, you know, antitrust. Some of the things they did violated antitrust laws. What do you think? And do you think that's going to affect them? Or I have no basis for judgment. I don't know a thing about them. All I know is that uh, what they wanted me to do, use my good name and use my uh, reputation as a matchmaker and create a sport w and bring me in to work in a sport that they were going to own all the fighters. I said at the time, if you own the fighters, you own the results. If you don't understand what that means in English, it means that if you own the fighters, you own the results. And that's why I didn't work for them. And that, you know, what you're saying is kind of might might be kind of why they've gone down this road. You know what I mean? That was their intention. Yeah. That was their intention. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Horian was guilty of the same thing. Purposeful mis mismatches. You know, oh, my my little brother in his pajamas uh, beats up the bodybuilder. You know, yeah, who do you think was going to win? Got to remember, you know, I'm uh, I'm with LaBelle, you know, and the Machados, and I'm watching this silliness on TV and going, you, could you get any weaker people to go up against them? But do you think it was a situation where they had a monopoly on the sport, you know, Back when they bought like Strike Force and you know some of those Strike Force and uh, WEC, I, you know uh, that I know a lot of things, right? I know a lot about a lot of things. I don't know anything about that. 
I, I honestly, I, I can't, I can't comment on it because I, I'm ignorant. I just kind of wanted your opinion on like what you think about where you have like one promotion dominating an entire sport, so to speak. I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I, I really don't, Todd. I just, first of all, I have absolutely no interest in it. But I put my heart and soul and all my creative ability and money into, into the sport that I wanted to create. And then people told me that, you know, there was going to be fake fights. And I don't want any part of that. But you don't want to go into more about that? or I'll, go, I'll talk about what I know about things. But I can't talk about, you know, an antitrust lawsuit. No, no, that maybe, maybe talk about some... people told you there are going to be fake fights. Maybe talk about that. The premise was that you're going to own the fighters. Right. You know, so Lucy Ball is going to fight Todd Atkins on September 3rd. Hmm, let's see. I think Todd's going to win. Lucy's been dead for 40 years, you know. It's interesting. I mean... Most people don't come right out and say that they were going to do fake fights, but you feel like that's what they were going to get into. They did. Right. Well, as you just think about, think about it. it. It happened before. I never did a fake fight. I would never, ever do that, right? But think about UFC Japan. Poor John McCarthy has to referee a tournament of fake fights. He has to stand there and act like he's a referee in in a fake fucking fight. I mean, I'm like this. I felt sorry for him. Yeah. Now, were my matches fake? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. You know, people watch Pancrase, right? And they think it's real. And then someone says, well, my, well, my fights were all real. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you. Who are you talking to? <laughs> How did you feel when you, when you left the UFC? Were you relieved or frustrated or, or what? You know, my, my, my life changed immediately because uh, I, left, uh, I left the film industry on the same day. So um, I already was going on to doing other things in my mind and I pour myself into things when I'm doing them. Um, but, uh, and again, I just never watched the fight again. Um, and then I heard that all the people that I retired, why did I retire people? It's like, well, listen, guy, you're slurring your speech. You're not making sense. You're taking punches for no reason. Well, there is a reason. You had a fucking referee. don't know what the fuck they're doing, you know, and letting you take pounding, pounding, and pounding, right? Um, I retire people. No, 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 you can't fight for me anymore. No, I'm sorry. Can't. Sorry, guy. You just, no, you're fucked up, right? Uh, and then I leave, and then they come back. You know? Or, or somebody comes who's, he's, He's okay. He's a little slow. He's this to that, you know, but he's a good wrestler, decent kickboxer, you know, and all of a sudden he fights a whole like slew of, of slugs. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me because, you know, I watch a fight. I know exactly what's going on. Uh, uh, it's obvious to me. It was obvious to me in the ultimate. You know, I'm, I'm looking at stuff. I'm going, that's not real. You know, and I'm in a room with fucking real people. You know, I'm in a room with 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 guys that know what they're doing. You know, they can tie their shoes. You know, and I see that and I go, well, that's not real. That's not a real fight. It's a bunch of shit. You know, I can be nice about it and say it was a purposeful mismatch. I can not nice about it and say, that's fucking work. And people used to, what's that thing? 
But something where they, they make pictures of you and put your name on it, put something on it. What's that thing called? Meme. Meme. So, you know, there's a lot of memes. There used to be a lot of memes floating around of me, you know, saying that's a work or that's a this or that or, you know, so. But I tell it like it is, you know, so it, it, it's important for me to to speak that kind of truth, you know, um, because I could see clearly what things are, not what you tell me they are. I want to ask you about Joe Silva, because I know kind of he followed you, right? Followed me. Well, he was the one. I don't want to say replaced you. You know. Yeah, he replaced me. Okay. Okay. I didn't. I said. I told. I told them on the phone. I said, "Well, you got that little guy that he wants my job. Give him my job." And they were like, "Oh, Joe Silva." I said, "Yeah, give him my job. He wants my job. He's been licking asses, you know, for a long time to try to get that job. Give him my job." But if you leave, in my opinion, he's not replacing you. He, he you use that word. I didn't use that word. If you're replaced against your will. In you my use that word. That's your word, not my word. It's not my word. Listen, you, in fact, when you said replace me, I said replace me. No, I said follow. Oh, follow. I said follow me. So I don't, I don't know what it means. You know, it's like. To me, he didn't replace you. He just followed you. You were. You still okay. Left. He followed you. Okay. Well, he's a guy. He's the next. He, he's a guy. I mean, uh, Bob loved him, you know, and he was just, he's very, uh, um, I recall him as being very um, uh, social. Because he kind of came up as a, just a fan, but then he gained all this power. How did he do that? Well, I mean, obviously he was. You buddied up to the right people, but I'm, it's osmotic, you, you know. You saw it more up close to me, so I wanted to know what you think. Well, it's it's, it's osmotic, you know. It's from a, a, a area of a greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. That's how things flow, right? So, you know, if you if you waddle around behind people enough, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get something, you know. Um, I thought it was really ridiculous about, I guess. 10, 15 years ago, they did they did the top 100 fights in UFC history, and I still had 50 of them. It, it's, that's absolutely ridiculous. We didn't have any money. We didn't have, we had nothing, you know. In fact, Bob gave me less money every, every, every time we had a fight because he had less money, supposedly. Um, it, it, it's just ridiculous, which proved that, you know, I don't know what they were doing, but they weren't making matches. Yeah, I mean, like James told me that he was like the super fan that Campbell was uh, getting, you know, like advice from or feedback from, and then he becomes the matchmaker, you know, over time. Well, I mean, if I would have kept that job, he would have he would have still been a, a janitor, you know. It's just, but I chose to leave. No one kicked me out. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's just wild that he ended up where he was, in my opinion. You know, if you if you're in the right position, you know, and you're licking the right asses, you know, you 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 assume that position and you 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 take over or whatever word you want to use. You know, um, yes, he became a matchmaker and became a multimillionaire and blah 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 blah. Why do you think Dana White is still around now after all the other guys have kind of the Partidas left, Joe left? Why do you think he stayed? I have no idea. I never met him. I never met him. You know, it was either like a boxing aerobic instructor in Boston or something who befriended a bunch of tough guys. You know, I mean. Because <laughs> he got obviously... his money just like they did. I'm just. He's got, he's obviously has a, a passion for what he does. Um, and uh, whatever that is from, you know, I don't know what he does, but the point is that, you know, he did what no one else could do. Uh, yeah, they had a giant budget and they, and they could, you know, 
control Vegas and, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, um, he, he did something truly amazing. I, I never met him. I didn't care to meet him. Um, Let's talk about something that we talked a little bit offline about why you were airbrushed out of the history of the UFC. Cause I know you talked a little bit with Bobby about this, but I'd like to hear you go more in depth about it. Because I thought well, you, I, I, I thought it was interesting I, what you were talking about. I mean, I don't know. We should get, you know, Dana White to tell you. Um, not me. Um, basically, you know, they did everything. They created the UFC, you know, and really it was all there before they got there. So I don't know what they created, but you know, besides this multi-million dollar, you know, industry and you know, all the uh um incredible uh ancillary you know takeovers um they did they did an amazing job i couldn't have done that zuckerman could have done that but i know he, he doesn't work that way um and you know they had the backings of you know the gambino crime family so i mean how do you how do you fucking lose and i'm a new yorker so and i'm neapolitan so um how, how do you lose? I don't understand how you could lose. And Bob, in his dis disingenuous uh, um, transaction with us, um, and not and admitting what were me saying, did he say it on air? He did. So admitting that were me saying that Bob never had any intention to sell to sell us the the UFC and keeping two hundred grand um, deposit. Uh, there you go. Now you got it all, right? So how do you lose? Well, you start to lose. They lost a lot of money at the beginning. They hired like retards to be commentators and, you know, and I don't know. It, all I cared about was the sport. That's all I cared about. So I didn't care about, you know, all this other stuff. I just cared about the sport and the fighters. And that was my job because I was a co-executive producer of Extreme Fighting. Okay. So that was my job. You know, we got rid of uh, what's his name who claims he coined mixed martial arts. Um, and and he didn't even coin it while he was there. You know, he, he, he coined it thereafter. You know, I bought him out. Uh, Rick Bloom, who was a pay-per-view guy, um, and uh, and a duplicitous little shit, also. Um, but how do you how do you how do you lose? You know, I, I, you know, you you own Vegas, you own boxing, you own everything, um, and you have power over everybody, and uh, and you get this little. This little guy to uh, who's uh, basically a sycophant, you know, to to run your to run your thing because you don't want to be in the headlines. Um, and 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 they did this wonderful job, and they and they created this incredible empire, and they ate other organizations for breakfast, and uh, so on and so forth. You know, I didn't have that. You know, I didn't have that convenience. You know, uh, I basically saved Bob Meyerowitz and David Isaacs from, from their last matchmaker who was taking, was taking bribes and, uh, and percentages off the top. You know, I researched that whole thing before I came in and had my, my first meeting with uh, Isaacs and uh, Meyerowitz, you know? So I don't know what to tell you, you know, there are things that I can answer and I will answer. Uh, and there are things that I don't have the answer for, Todd, and I apologize for that. But you know, I don't, I don't have those answers. You know, I, um, I don't know anything about it. You know. Let me ask you about Dan Lambert, kind of before we finish up, because Dan was the guy who was kind of involved. He was the one who was involved with you in trying, trying to purchase the UFC, right? Yes. So, kind of tell tell people a little bit about Dan. Well, we were. We were in process of purchasing the UFC. Right. So tell it's people. It's just that it's just that Bob was duplicitous. Right. 
What I want you to do is tell fans, people who don't know who Dan, Lam most people don't know who he is. Maybe tell them who Dan Lambert is and why he was involved with you in, in this process. He had money. Period. Right, but he was a fan of the sport, you know, that kind of thing, right? He was with the American top team, et cetera, et cetera. Because yeah, he had money. Right. We're looking for people with money. We had Dan Duva, you know, but he had to but he had to die. Um, so we 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 lost Dan Duva. Um, and then his son didn't want to do, you know, do this stuff. Um, so we lost that for extreme fighting. That was a devastating day. You know, Dan dies, who wants to put in 50% to keep us going because he thinks the sport is going to be bigger than boxing. Um, and he was right, and we were right. And uh, he died. Uh, he had power. Dan had power, right? What's his name? Had money. Period. Why do you think, because I, I had heard you mention to Bobby that he lost his deposit or whatever. How does that happen? Was not, How does that happen with Bob with to keep it? Not, <laughs> not paying attention. I remember Donald saying, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. He's just going to take that money. And uh, that's what he did. How does that work where he gets to take it? So How does that work? Oh, I, I don't. You, that's that's a Zuckerman question. Um, but he, they put that money down and let him use it as like a loan to do the next show. And uh, and and uh, Bob and his brother, so there was his lawyer, uh, were very shrewd. Mm. I didn't see that coming. You know, I really thought we were buying the ultimate. I was walking around going, "I'm going to fire him, fire him, I'm going to fire that little short guy, I'm going to fire him." We get rid of all these stupid motherfuckers, right? That makes. But sense. I was, but I was wrong. I was wrong. Yeah, because I remember hearing you talk to Bobby, and I was like, I wonder what he means by the guy lost his deposit. But now, what you're saying that makes total sense. Hmm. Yeah, I think it was a really bad business move, and Donald warned him. But I mean, that makes total sense. If he put his money in to the show, he can't complain. Just like you said, he can't complain. He he invested. He lost. He has no recourse, really. No, it was it was it was a dumb move, and uh, you know, wasn't shrewd. And uh, um, Bob was was shrewd, and um, You know, he did what he he did what he did. You know, uh, I I didn't see it coming. Donald saw it coming. Now, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and answer these this stuff and take you know me down the memory lane as far as extreme fighting goes and stuff. I just want to ask you, you know, as of we're kind of winding the interview down, if there's anything I didn't touch on or something that maybe people listen to this you wanted to. Maybe leave the interview on that you think is important, or well, uh, I think we should do a part two. Sure. You know, if you're interested in doing that, yeah. because I think that that to understand, um, to understand me and 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 my focus, uh, we need a little more in depth study. Um, There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, misconceptions and delusion and, um, and there's a lot of uh, disinformation out there about how this thing went down and how, and how it got started. And, you know, who was the brainchild of this and who, like Dr. Aswanek and I, creating gloves. And now Hicks and Gracie, you know, decides that he's, he, he made those gloves. Let's see, were you, were you sewing them or, or were, were you, um, where were you? 
uh, when we were doing it, you know, the bottom people say, um, you know, there's a lot of fucking journalists in, in, in this thing uh, now who, and people who have written books that are just hilarious by my speculation um, that say, you know, that, uh, well, this happened and that happened and this happened. Oh, were you there? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I had 16 concussions. I just don't remember you there in 1990. Oh, wait a second. You weren't born in 1990. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, or someone else saying, well, I don't, just don't wait for your face. Um, that, that uh, you know, I don't, I, I, what was he talking about? You know, it's like, well, it's because you don't know what we were doing. You don't know how difficult it was to do it. You don't know what we went through, the trials and tribulations, the, you know, you know, replacing fighters in the last, you know, in the next 12 hours, and you're in the middle of fucking Canada, you know, um, you have no idea what, what, how difficult it was to, to do what I wanted to do and what Donald wanted to do. Um, you have no idea what, what, what that man accomplished, you know. Um, so uh, there's a lot to talk about if you're interested. You know, just put your questions together. I, I told you, I said, did you read my memoirs? You and know what? Said, no. Miguel has read it. I, I said, I told Miguel, hey, I'm going inter to interview John Peretti. And he said, have you seen this book? He put it, he showed me a picture and I was like, you know what? He asked me to read that book. He's like, I've read this book. Well, the thing is that that there's a, it, it's it's a diversified life, and and there's a lot to it. Um, there's a, a spot in there that talks about this kind of thing, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff in print there that that makes a lot of sense, and and is in you know in the defilade of other books that don't make any sense. Tell people, but people the book it. and where they can find it if they wanted to purchase it. You could find it on Lulu or Amazon or anything. Um, it, uh, it's The Origin of a Species and the Mixed Martial Arts by John Peretti. You know, here, I got something. Hang on a second. Ugh, excuse me. So this, I don't know. Can you see that, Todd? Yeah. yeah. This was hung over my crib when I was born. I mean, that's, that's how much, you know, this whole uh, pugilistic thing was, was in my blood. Um, you know, uh, you know, I read, I, I met Rocky Marciano when I was, um, uh, when I was like 10 years old. Um, so I think that there's a lot, a lot more to the story. Um, and that, you know, we were, we were uh, really dedicated to doing um, a, a great sport. Um, and there was a lot of disinformation and a lot of stuff was put against us that, that wasn't true. Uh, so, you know, that's it. You know, um, I think that uh, it would be nice to do another interview um, and uh, to focus on some other things. Oh, absolutely. You know, I usually try to keep them like in an hour because I could talk. I could talk all day about stuff, but I don't want to take up everybody's time. You know, I try to. Keep I, it I understand. But, you know, that people say, oh, how come how come uh, um, how come, you know, you're not on so and so show? I don't know. How come? How come they 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 talk about things that that aren't real? never happened how come i don't know i don't can i why why aren't you being interviewed on so and so show uh i don't know right it's a good question it's a good fucking question you know if you're gonna say you know why didn't he do this or do that or do this or do that you know and i don't know a lot you know militish i think said it best you know uh he said uh you know a lot of people take credit for the things john peretti did but it was John Peretti who did them. Right. The victors read history. You said that in Bobby's interview. So, and, you know, the, if you, if you understand, you know, that, uh, that 
it might not be the way that you've been told it was, you know, and just because you're a, you know, a jujitsu sycophant, you know, who believes that, uh, that, you know, that it's, you know, it's the best thing since white bread, you know, um, it might not be true. You know, I, I coach at the uh, Gus George Academy, police Academy, you know, so uh, I know, you know, that the world changed 22 years ago, 26 years ago, but I changed it. And, and now everyone trains and does this and does that and does this, except the police departments, which are, you know, 50 years behind the times, you know, so we're trying to bring that around too, trying to bring that up because everybody thinks, you know, these Krav Magarians, you know, they think that, uh, you know, they created the, you know, the, the number six block or the number four block or, you know, or, you know, or leaving, you know, a position that you have dominance in to reassess it, you know, or that, you know, jujitsu is the, is the, is grappling, but jujitsu is not grappling, you know, it's different. So anyway, there's a lot we can talk about. You just get your, get your questions together, Todd. I really appreciate that you brought me on. Uh, maybe it'll be contagious. Maybe someone else will say, hey, hey what if this so-and-so said this, but he said that, you know. But thank you. I really appreciate it, Todd. And I think most people today would agree with us about Hickson, you know, because I said the same things you were saying back on the underground back in the day like this record can't be true he has the opportunity to fight these guys why isn't he doing it you know he's in his prime what's going on you know i couldn't i couldn't match him yeah and if i couldn't match him right for a million dollars a fight and now i think everybody say? else thinks it's a joke now but no one thought that back then they would, Nor did they, I. they would go right I, at you if you said something like that. But now everyone thinks it's a joke. Shit. It's you know, I, I wanted to match him against Boss Rutten so quickly. I was like, I got it. No problem. 198-pound limit, Boss Rutten. Oh, no, you, they have to do this, and then we need oh, no rounds. Or they, okay, we'll change my whole fucking sport for you guys. We could go on and on about that. <laughs> I'm not here to I'm not here to bust Nixon's balls. Yeah. You know, I could bust a lot of people's balls right now, but I you're not hearing me do that. Yeah. Um what I'm saying is that what you've heard, not you personally, what you've heard collectively may not be true. I can tell you about mostly every fighter that I can remember. I can tell you what they did and how they did it. Bob Marowitz took me off the air for saying, there it is. Say, so it looks like he's going to throw a right round kick to the left side of his side. Oh, there it is. You can't do that, John. Why is that? Because it sounds like th that we pre-recorded this. Are you nuts, Bob? I said it before it happened. Yeah, but that looks like it's not real. No, it looks like I can see things before other people can see them so that I say them. You can't do that. And there it is. So you don't understand what I had to contend with, and no pun intended, the contenders. Yeah, I think it, I'd love to do more with you. And like I said, if I could bring Miguel on, because Miguel's like, He's got a great mind for the history. You can you can bring anybody on you want. Bring on people that disagree with me. Yeah. I'll make a mockery of them. But I think he's got, you know, he's got a great mind for the history. He loves the history. He's read your book, you know, and I think it would be good to bring out more stuff like you're saying. And, Let's do it. And I could hit him up and say we need to come up with more questions like you're saying. And uh, yeah. Great. Let's do it. Whatever you want. I really appreciate you taking time to do this. No, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, for anyone watching this, you know, this is John is for me, it was really important to interview him to get 
information out here for newer fans that didn't know that this stuff existed. Like you got people like Errol Hwani saying that Zufa initiated the rounds and, you know, went toward... Who said that? Errol Hwani, you know, the, the guy... the fuck the is that? Pop- He's like the one who's got the biggest show, you know, the the biggest uh, journalistic. Well, I guess I guess he's not going to put me on, huh? Right. But John McCarthy kind of came on when he said that. He said it on a documentary on ESPN. Chuck versus T. Oh, yeah. I don't know. If and I remember that. and I remember that they didn't they didn't want me to be interviewed for that documentary. Yeah. John McCarthy came on Twitter and he was like, hold on a minute. You know, this what you said is not true, you know. Zufa was not the first people to go towards sanctioning. That is not true. Zufa did not initiate the rounds. That's not true. What you're saying is not true. You know? So John McCarthy called him out on all that stuff that he said on that documentary. He's like, you were perpetuating something that is not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and you know, John McCarthy, I, I always liked John McCarthy. Um, he, uh, he and I did not always see the eye to eye, and I criticized him a lot about his refereeing when I was uh, in extreme fighting. Um, and um, and I told him probably like ten years ago that you know I was really thinking about you know becoming a police officer again, you know, to and and I became the uh, the oldest uh, police officer on patrol in the United States. So, and I, I, I owe a little bit of that to John McCarthy actually. Um, and um, and uh, so I'm just saying hi to him right now and his wife, Elaine. Yeah, I was always wondering what it'd be like to be pulled over by you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you read the riot act by John, John Peretti, you know. Yeah, well, uh, I'm I'm a hands-on guy. <laughs> well, as, as again, John, I appreciate taking time to do this, and anybody who you know watch this, I appreciate the support, and you know, stay tuned for part two. Probably be better than part one. Now that now that I think about it, and uh, until next time, take care. <laughs>